webinar is now live. Welcome everybody. We're going to get started in just a minute. I'm going to give another minute or two for people to log in. This is the Tahoe Climate Change Action Network hosting a webinar today on ways to engage in climate action locally. We'll give it just one minute. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started and let everybody know that we are streaming live on Facebook right now. I love when technology works. So welcome to Climate Week in South Lake Tahoe, sponsored by the Tahoe Climate Change Action Network. I'm gonna get us started in just a moment, but I wanna to say to um, all of our attendees, thank you so much for, for coming. I invite you to share your thoughts on the chat and to um, engage via our Q&A here. My um, friend uh, and colleague through the Sierra Nevada Alliance in the city of South Lake Tahoe is Jackson there, who is our um, Civic Spark Climate Fellow. He's gonna be managing our chat and Q&A board. So thank you very much for that. Um, and with that, we will continue on. All right, well, climate change is impacting our quality of life here at Tahoe. We've got tourists flooding our towns as they escape from climate change effects of heat and fire. And we have scientists saying that climate change is a leading threat to Tahoe's famous clarity. It took a sharp downward turn this, this year as um, waters continue to warm. We're left at asking ourselves how we can model solutions and educate our locals and our visitors. This week, Tahoe-based activists have been hosting conversations aimed at engaging more people to the point of taking action on climate. We seek to convince you that your individual contribution is necessary toward achieving the city's and the worldwide goal of cutting greenhouse gas emissions in half by 2030. We're counting down to net zero, in fact, and we're counting down the days till next November 2021 when world leaders are going to come together again on this issue and pledge, we hope, substantive action on a policy level, a systemic level, because they will have been inspired by a whole year of local climate actions all over the world. So we hope this series of talks this week will inspire you to join others who are taking action in a variety of ways and because we know that only through collective action can we make it to this ultimate and urgent goal of zero net emissions to avert the worst climate scenarios. So you're joining me today to learn some inspiring opportunities for your engagement. And this is the sixth in a seven part series. And tomorrow I'm gonna to be hosting something of a watch party in partnership with folks at the TEDx organization who um, will be sharing some content um, with local leaders, folks like this group right here and folks in, in little communities all over the world. They've put together a series of talks by inspiring global level leader, leaders, including folks like Pope Francis and also some like hip hop stars and stuff. There's some really cool stuff that's coming on, hosting this watch party tomorrow at noon to see and inspire us all to understand that our local efforts fit into a global vision. All right, so tomorrow at noon, you can register through the, our website at the Tahoe Climate Change Action Network. So today, I am your host, Sarah Letton, 
about, um, I don't know, gosh, it's been a year or two maybe now um, that I attended an Earth Day event here in South Lake Tahoe and I met some motivated people who, um, one of those was Nick Exline, who's invited here today. And um, he and others were working to advise the city council on a path toward achieving the city's remarkable pledge to transition to renewable energy by 2032. I was eager, I was new to town, I had this belief that collective action matters to achieving systemic change and that we needed to really start addressing this crisis because, you know, I graduated from high school in the 90s and I, I got this environmental degree and I joined the Peace Corps, I went to Africa and I thought I was like do it, doing everything I could. Having kids kind of distracted me a while but I knew climate change was happening. I just assumed that someone was out there addressing it, right? That's, it was such a big deal. I mean, somebody must really be taking this seri seriously and, and, and doing something about it. And in recent years, I, um, I, I, I realized that there's just really not enough happening and not happening soon enough. And then, you know, the election, last election happened and I realized that this, um, science denialism was becoming kind of like this acceptable way of, of, of being. And as a former science teacher, that really bothered me, you know, that somebody could use the word belief and science in the same, in the same sentence. When the fact is that science provides us the facts by which we can make decisions, right? So um, I know Sue, one of my guests can feel me there as a former teacher herself. <laughs> so, I, it's really important that that um, that facts are acted upon appropriately, and that we take we use all the facts of science. We've known about you know climate change, global warming for well over a hundred years, but urgency <laughs> is at our doorstep now. So today, I have a number of guests who are doing both volunteer and professional work that are addressing climate change at different levels. It might be we're doing individual kind of things. We're doing systemic things, we're, we're, tr we're working in, to do what we can to influence federal policy. So we have representatives for all of these types of efforts on the panel today, and I hope that attendees will be inspired by one or more of these attendees to join their efforts. So huh, with that, um, I, uh, I'm going to maybe just quickly introduce the panel and then I'm going to be starting with, with Nick. So our first speaker is going to be Nick Exline, representing today for a moment the Tahoe Climate Change Action Network. I've also got um, Deidre Henderson for, uh, representing the Citizens Climate Lobby, Janet Atkinson with Schools for Climate Action, Dylan Martin with the Sunrise Movement, um, Maria Nercheva with the Sugar Pine Foundation, Jeanette Tillman with South Tahoe Refuse, and Sue Chandler with the Democratic Club of South Lake Tahoe. So welcome to everybody. Thank you for joining us this hour. Um, again, to attendees, um, Jackson's gonna be keeping an eye on that Q&A and the chat, and I invite Jackson to, go, to unmute and bring any great questions to our attention as the conversation flows, all right? And our guests, I'm gonna be speaking directly to you all one by one, but I do encourage the cross-pollination if you have ideas or anything that you wanna add to one another's um, contribution, go ahead and unmute and contribute. All right. So with this now, I'm gonna turn attention to guest um, Nick Exline. I want you to tell us a little bit about where the Tahoe Climate Change Action Network comes from. And um, I know you're, you're engaged in so many things in this town, but uh, as an opportunity, like what, what is the Cl Tahoe Climate Change Action Network doing and what inspired you? Yeah, definitely. I, you know, and really, I just would like to start honestly with, um, with, uh, you know, recognizing Sarah, this was really her idea to bring forward the Sunday event, um, work diligently to bring this forward. It's been an amazing opportunity to kind of highlight climate action right as the ballots are coming out. Um, and, you know, we have no time to waste. So really, it's just the onset want to, you know, highlight Sarah for all her hard work, and everything she's been doing. It's just truly amazing. Um, you know, for me, you know, the climate change process began. I'm the son of a university professor and a mom that worked in church, and I love the outdoor world. And so what I found was that when science and religion come together, that's a unique, that's a unique thing in this world. Um, 
and I couldn't stand by why I saw the, the things I loved most be removed. Um, and so I had to become engaged. And so, you know, I, I, one of the hardest things I think dealing with climate change is I didn't inherently, and I still don't look at life through a political lens. I look at it through, you know, many different lenses, but certainly not political. So as I'm living in Tahoe, I uh, had been working as a land use planning consultant and I um, routinely kind of in my day-to-day -day job, I was addressing all kinds of environmental challenges in the Tahoe Basin, looking at them, considering them. Um, one of them was really absent and that was climate change. Uh, we didn't have to really review climate change. You didn't have to consider how much your greenhouse gases emissions were going up as a result of a development or project or any of those things. So it was, a, it was based solely on the desires of someone that wanted to do something to reduce their greenhouse gases, but it wasn't being required and no one was even really thinking about it. Why this was so concerning to me is that I was fully aware that um, regardless of what we do in the Tahoe Basin to ensure late clarity, um, through water quality improvements and measures, Lake Tahoe's clarity is going down. And the reason it's going down is climate change. It's, it's actually rather simple. With warming temperatures, you have in, um, a greater pollination and greater opportunity for algae growth. And that's what you see in the near shore around Tahoe right now. And that's what's the driving cause of Lake clarity loss now is climate change. So the fact these agencies were not dealing with it um, seemed a mistake, seemed inappropriate, and really just seemed to you know, be, I don't want to say putting their heads in the sand, but it certainly wasn't taking the opportunity for political reasons or for whatever else, um, didn't want to address it. And so that really kind of opens us up into the, the you know, volunteer space. So, you know, I, I actually began, and I know someone will be speaking out about it later, and I still work a lot with this group with the Citizens Climate Lobby, and they do amazing work. Um, well, what I felt about here locally was, you know, we need to have someone addressing climate change here locally and put a lens on it. And it has to be considered with everything we do. Um, you know, true, we're a small community, but we're also Lake Tahoe. We have 20 million guests and people Lake Tahoe. So what we did will, you know, inspire and will actually show other people, you know, what is possible. And so really this founding of the Climate Change Action Network was, was just that, was to bring climate um, change to the attention of people south, of South Lake and the Tahoe Basin, and really look to just you know work with people to to help address this issue, both from you know what we could do here locally, but also use our local example as um, something that could be duplicated elsewhere, and and just something you know that people could look to as in a positive idea and a positive development in this world full of negativity and argumentative nature and all those kind of different things, and so the Climate Change Action Network was started from there. Uh, What's interesting is, you know, like anyone else that started something, um, I started at times sitting in libraries by myself because you'd say, hey, let's talk about climate change and people wouldn't show up, right? <laughs> and, you know, honestly, I, I didn't get discouraged. I kind of thought about kind of starting a, uh, uh, a new nonprofit in Tahoe that's loaded with nonprofits, um, like starting a band, you know, I was willing to play anywhere. I'm still willing to play anywhere and sing in front of everybody. Although I'm not going to sing for you guys today because you don't want to hear that. <laughs> But the point being, I, I never missed an opportunity to speak and I never missed an opportunity to, to engage with people at that level and use the interactions that I developed from a political standpoint just in my day to day life. Yeah. Um, and what was really amazing about that opportunity is, you know, as Sarah had said, we started doing climate change marches. We had done the 100 percent renewable committee and more and pe more and people got engaged and wanted to work towards it and wanted to see improvements and just I think really just wanted to see when you work with people that are doing positive, progressive things, um, you want to be around that and it becomes addictive. And so, you know, I email now with members of the Tahoe Climate Change Action Network more than I email with people from work. Um, <laughs> it's really became, you know, a passion for me and something that, you know, in these dark times, you know, can, can be something that we can look to, to, um, to work towards improvement instead of just, you know, looking at the news and feeling hopeless. And so really the Climate Change Action Network was really just providing an opportunity for people to get engaged on the issue of climate change in a really open format. And I think the important thing is, is we take people where they are. Um, some people, you know, really want to get engaged, do amazing things like Sarah's done. Some people don't have that, just want to be in a mailing list and write a letter of support. And we find you wherever, wherever you are. Um, and I think that's really important in kind of the nonprofit world is finding people where they are. And then also, you know, being really open-minded. Um, being really empathetic, especially to those people that disagree with you, 
And kind of those, those pieces have really, you know, shown that if you do it in that way, people will want to work with you to do something positive. And that positive energy can create real substantive change in your community. And so starting the Climate Change Action Network and work in that regard has been truly amazing. And, and meeting the people that I've had an opportunity to meet has been one of the great opportunities and privileges of my life, um, including everybody on this call. And so, you know, that's really how it got started. Um, and so, you know, I'll kind of leave it there. So, you know, provide enough time for everybody else. Uh, but, you know, really good opportunity. I just, again, thank you, Sarah, and thank everybody for participating today. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Nick. Yeah, I just um, want to express appreciation for the organization. I think it really does meet people where they're at because really it started out almost as like a, a listserv, right? And it's just providing opportunities. It's just you saying, hey, you can show up to this thing. Hey, you can take this action. And people can pick and choose but depending on what kind of time they have, right? And then just recently right. we amped up our ability to, to um to expand that message by by initiating the website and getting some of these webinars up there and on a recording so people can engage again with, with this kind of um, format when they have time. So again, I'm just gonna plop right. that um, in the in the box there, the climate change action network.org website. It comes up a little bit low on Google Hits right now because it's so brand new, but if you <laughs> use that link, <laughs> you can get there. Um, and uh, you can reach out through the website. Or, and, and Nick, um, as we're chatting with the next uh, folks, um, you can put your contact in the box and I'll let people know too. I'm gonna end the webinar with a slide. You can take a screenshot. I'll have it as everybody's contact info if you're um, looking to uh, reach out to anyone. So um, next, um, again, thank you so much, Nick. Um, next, I want to um, move over and talk to Deidre Henderson. You are, um, you don't live here right here in South Lake Tahoe, but you are up in North Lake and you're doing all kinds of things with the Citizens Climate Lobby. So I, um, I'd, I'd love to hear, um, first off, like really what your, your personal uh, reason is for engaging with climate change and then tell us a little bit about your organization and what it does. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Thank you for doing this whole wonderful week of webinars. And um, I very much appreciate the invitation to, um, to talk with you. So um, uh, climate change is personal for me because I'm a parent and a grandparent. Um, as I began learning about climate change about 10 years ago now, I did a lot of reading and uh, one of the things that became apparent to me uh, pretty quickly is that climate change is the biggest intergenerational equity issue that's facing us. Um, and, you know, I realized that um, I was working hard as, uh, as an individual to give my kids um, good moral values, a good education, uh, diverse and rich experiences, <laughs> But the one thing I could not give them as an individual was leaving them a livable world. And, um, it, and uh, I realized that it really required me to find a way to act collectively. So of course I did all the things that people usually do. I changed the light bulbs, I upgraded the insulation, I changed the furnace, I investigated solar, I did all of those individual things but I needed to find a way into acting with others on climate change. And um, as the, um, the wonderful writer and climate activist, Bill McKibben uh, has said many times, uh, the most effective thing you can do as an individual about climate change is stop being an individual. Mm, and, I like that. And uh, the late Marshall Saunders, who was the founder of Citizens Climate Lobby, uh, always used to say to us, uh, we can't wait around for the cavalry to ride in and save us. We are the cavalry. Um, so as I read uh, more and more about climate change and about how to deal with it, I realized that a theme that I found with, through economics reading and reading from climate scientists was that one of the most effective things we can do is to put a price on carbon. And around that time, um, I found Citizens Climate Lobby, which is dedicated to doing exactly that. Um, so 
I'm working as a citizen advocate on uh, a particular climate solution um, because I feel that's going to be my legacy to my children. Um, and that motivates me every day. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, it is a uh, grassroots, national, nonprofit, and importantly, nonpartisan organization. It's volunteer driven. We have about 600 chapters now around the world, um, many uh, in the United States and in Canada. And um, we uh, concentrate on two things on helping volunteers um, to realize their power as citizens and um, as citizen advocates. And we train, we do formal training on citizen advocacy skills. And then our focus, our policy focus, is on building political will in our communities for the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, which is H.R. 763. It's a bill in Congress. And it embodies a policy called carbon fee and dividend, which we have proposed and been lobbying Congress about um, since 2009. It was introduced as a bill in um, uh, 2019. It was negotiated by both Republicans and Democrats in the House. We had um, a role in helping that uh, along. Um, I'll tell you uh, a little bit about that bill, but first I want to tell you about the kinds of activities that every CCL chapter engages in. They basically fall into five groups, um, and there are five things that we train to do well. We call them five levers of political will, and um, you will see that we are really betting the farm on building relationships, which is another core value of the organization. So we engage in lobbying. We build relationships with our members of Congress. It doesn't matter if they're Republicans or Democrats. It doesn't even matter if they're climate deniers. We are going to talk to them and build a relationship and try to find some kind of common ground. Um, we also uh, lobby. We lobby by having um, in-person meetings with members of Congress or their staffs. We do it in Washington, we do it in district. And um, we also send letters, we telephone, we provide resources to them. We are a resource to members of Congress on climate solutions. Um, second area of activity is building a relationship with media. And we have done that with our local media. We are great at getting letters to the editor and op-eds. Um, published in our local media. Um, and uh, if you don't know how to do that, we'll teach you how to do it. It's really, uh, it's really something that people can grow into doing if they don't know how to do it. We also engage in grassroots outreach. We table, we give presentations around um, the area. Um, reaching out to individual members of the community, tell them what we're about, tell them about the policy that we're supporting and try to get their support for it. Um, we also do grass tops outreach. One of the things that's really important when you're working to get Congress to do something is to have local leaders and influences support what you're doing. And that's, uh, that's what we do. We have, uh, initially we asked, um, we asked them to support a carbon fee and dividend policy gen uh, generally, and now we ask them to support the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. We have gotten about 30 businesses in our area to support it. We have gotten um, the town of Truckee, the city of South Lake, the city of Nova uh, Nova the town of Nevada City to all support the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act with formal resolutions. Uh, and we sent all of the prep materials that we used to do that to our friends in the Reno, Nevada chapter, and they're, not wor they're now working on getting their city government to endorse it. Um, 
And uh, we also, of course, engage in chapter building. We want to increase the size of our chapter. But it's not just numbers. We are interested in identifying groups within the community that we want to feel comfortable about working with us mm -hmm. on this policy. So, for example, we want to make sure that we're reaching out to conservatives um, to one of the things we're working on now is reaching out to young people, to high school and middle school students, Re reaching out to the Latinx community, which is an important and I think underserved area uh, 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 segment of our communities. So we're building our political will for the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. Basically what it does is it puts a fee on uh, fossil fuels as they come out of the ground and into the economy. That fee uh, starts low and goes up every year. And that those funds go into a government trust fund, which distributes the funds monthly to every household in America as a carbon dividend. And um, there are other parts of the bill that I'm not going to go into, but that's the basic idea of the policy. And it is, um, it is an effective policy. Um, it will reduce carbon pollution by 40% in the first 12 years. It's good for people. It puts money in their pockets. It's good for the economy. It actually will create jobs in our local community. It's bipartisan, and we feel strongly that any climate solution that's going to have longevity, that's going to work, has to have bipartisan um, uh, support. And it's revenue neutral. Um, money will not stay with the government. It will go back to the American people. And Deidre, uh, can I ask you a quick question? Mm -hmm. do, do you have, the folks that are working in your organization, are they paid or are they volunteers? We're, in our local chapters, we're all volunteers. There is a oh, wow. national staff. They are paid. Most of them started out as volunteers in local chapters. Interesting. Uh, and we have a very small local, we have a very small national staff. We have uh, a staff in Washington that regularly keeps in touch with Congress. Um, but we really, the volunteers, are the people who make the organization work. I love so. that. So, so Deidre, we have a couple groups um, represented on the panel here that are kind of uh, do some parallel work to what the CCL does. And mm -hmm. I wonder if now we can, we can um, jump over and check in with Janet to see how um, she's kind of one of those groups that you were kind of getting at and how, how they're kind of do, taking um, this issue from a different angle. Can we, can we jump over to Janet now? And then yeah. we'll head over to Dylan. Great, thank you so much. Hi, thank you, Sarah. Yes, um, I work with Deirdre closely in Citizens Climate Lobby, the North Tahoe chapter, and I just added in the chat that um, we actually are including people around the Tahoe Basin um, in the work with Citizens Climate Lobby and, of course, Truckee as well. Um, so, uh, Schools for Climate Action actually grew out of Citizens Climate Lobby uh, with the same kind of philosophy of citizen engagement um, and advocacy for climate solutions at a national level. The way it um, started was with a teacher uh, and his children in Sonoma, and, they, and he was actually involved with Citizens Climate Lobby. But back in uh, 2017, when the first Sonoma fires started uh, taking place, they were actually organizing this, uh, this mm -hmm. grassroots nonpartisan nonprofit um, that is multi-generational and the purpose of Schools for Climate Action is to bring the ed sector's voice as a um, as leaders and, and trusted messengers to Congress calling for national action on climate change. So we're looking at all levels of involvement with students at student councils, uh, PTAs, school boards, and then your state and national allies in education, such as school psychologist organizations and school nurses organizations. Um, and so what we're doing is gathering uh, everyone's voice through resolutions. And I wanna uh, give a shout out to uh, Lake Tahoe Unified 
for um, being a great example and model of that. I think Nick worked with uh, Climate Parents and some other individuals. Um, Bonnie Turnbull has been instrumental um, in South Lakes community and bringing the voice of their educational leaders uh, and saying, you know, there needs to be uh, recognition that climate change is a generational justice and equity issue and that leaders and education can call on Congress to act. So back in um, 2015, actually, um, the California State PTA came out with a resolution called Climate Change is a Children's Issue. And then in 2016, the National PTA created a statement very similarly. And in 2017, your district um, of Lake Tahoe Unified put out the Healthy and Environmentally Sound Schools Resolution. In 2018, um, I through my work with Schools for Climate Action and to acknowledge these other resolutions that came before, um, engaged um, Tahoe Truckee Unified and they put out a very similar resolution. So what these resolutions do is again, um, just recognize this as a generational justice and equity issue and call on uh, Congress to act. And I got started with it because I was an active parent and also a, a teacher. And, um, you know, around that time, 2016, 2015, um, you know, I could have conversations with students in grade school who knew about the impacts of their own um, consumerism, for example, and things that, that they were seeing happening around the world on climate, but yet, there was no way to empower them. And, um, you know, they could do their individual actions, changing the light bulbs. There's things that, you know, we always talk about, for example, and recycling, but to empower them and bring them into the broad world of acting for climate, um, this is where we've gone on the, on the timeline and, and at least in my own experience. So um, after, uh, getting involved with Schools for Climate Action, I was then able to say to students, parents, school board members, and state level and national level allies in education, look, we can all speak with one voice, and you, as in student le leadership, um, leadership at the board level and school districts, for example, can pass these resolutions, and then these resolutions are used in our advocacy in in Washington DC with members of Congress. So just like a uh, citizens climate lobby that uh, has citizens advocate and, and talk with members of Congress, so uh, do we assemble students, teachers, parents, and peoples at all these at, in all these other levels of the ed sector to speak to Congress as well. So that's how we leverage the resolutions. The resolutions are statements. They can um, not only recognize uh, this as a generational justice and equity issue and call on Congress to act, but they can reaffirm and celebrate their sustainable practices in their own districts. But um, I just have to draw the distinction that Schools for Climate Action is about getting action on a national level through the ed sector and all voices at all levels are welcome to do that and later I can tell how to do that. Wonderful, thank you so much Janet and just as a as a small celebration to let you know how your work has kind of a domino effect we just recently uh, the work of our, some local high school students just um, resulted in the passing of a resolution that's leading to um, climate education in our local schools here. So if somebody uh, in the attendees wants to throw up a link there that announces that, it's um, it's a big step and it's really something to be proud of. And I know that you were part of the laying the groundwork for that. So very well done. We appreciate your efforts so much. And again, Janet too, and you are, you and your organization, are you all volunteer as well? Yes, 100%. Um, and and very connected to students. Mm -hmm. So the hub for Schools for Climate Action is in Sonoma still, 
that's where it began and that's where the group uh, of it's generally it's mostly students who run the website and the organization mm -hmm. um, with some long term you know people who've been involved in it um, adult allies like myself who help make these um, these things happen uh, schools for climate action has a reach throughout the United States from coast to coast and in between um, a lot of our action seems to um, start with people connected to citizens climate lobby who are working with youth and this is one uh, tool in the toolkit that youth can um, get active with uh, to extend their voice in a larger capacity to Congress. Wonderful. And on that note, I'm just going to thank you. And we're going to turn it over to, to Dylan here, who is one of those youth who's engaged in, the, in a similar vein of work. Um, and uh, let's, let's, let's see, let's check in with Dylan. Let's see. How are you doing, Dylan, with the yeah. Sunrise Movement? What brought you into climate change work? Yeah, thanks for having me. I think that one of the biggest motivators for all, all the youth activists is obviously knowing that uh, we will be directly affected. We will feel the effects of climate change in our lives. And so that's obviously a huge motivator for us. Um, so uh, my name is Dylan. I'm representing Sunrise Movement and I'm representing local youth activists here in South Lake Tahoe. And I know that when, when we're all motivated, it's when we think about how uh, the decisions that we make or don't make now will define what the rest of our lives actually look like and the lives of, you know, our, our future children, our families. Uh, there's a very real fear among a lot of youth that the places we grew up in will be unrecognizable in the future. And that, uh, that, that chance for a decent life will be stolen from us because we just won't be able to, to, uh, to live in the way that, uh, previous generations have been able to live. Um, yeah. So that's, that's definitely a big, big motivator for all of us. Yeah, it's, it's, I think about that so much and it, it definitely, it motivates me when I think about my kids growing up in, in the world described by these worst case scenarios. Now you're with the Sunrise Movement and um, I know that has something to do with the work, um, paralleling the work of the Citizens Climate Lobby. Can you tell a little bit more about that and, um, and how people can can join you. Yeah, uh, so Sunrise Movement is a youth-led movement that uh, popped up in 2018 uh, when they were doing work during the 2018 election to get as many progressive climate uh, advocates into government as possible. And that's where we saw the campaigns of people like AOC and uh, people like like her coming into Congress and really pushing for climate action. And the, uh, the idea that our movement really rallies around is the Green New Deal, which is a kind of, it's, it's more of a concept than the actual legislation where it takes the lessons that we've learned from previous uh, activists, whether that be from the civil rights movement, from the 1930s New Deal era, or just from the uh, failures of recent uh, activists for the environment from the 70s onward that led us to this point and came to the conclusion that in order to combat climate change you have to combat other issues as well such as economic inequality such as racial inequality because they all tie together to create the system that keeps perpetuating uh, and allowing massive corporations to produce um, an abhorrent amount of co2 and 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 wreck the atmosphere. I believe the Guardian uh, reported three years ago that just 100 companies are responsible for 71% of global emissions, which wow. is kind of echoing what, what Nick said earlier, where individual action is, is important, but it is not nearly enough. And we have to really, really hold those companies and our government accountable for uh, making sure that we make the change necessary to ensure a livable future for everyone. Yeah, for sure. I know the U United Nations is um, we're, is encouraging large companies to do sustainability reporting now, for example. That's something that people can access online and, um, and look at these kind of like 30 to 60 page reports to try to make their case that they're, they're trying to do better. But it really does take, you know, pressure from consumers 
right? To, to reach out and tell them what, what we're okay with and what we're not okay with. I think, I think more importantly than that, it takes pressure from government. I don't, I don't sure. think this is entirely an, an issue where uh, almost in the same way the civil rights movement required government legislation from a government mm -hmm. that wasn't really uh, excited about passing the legislation. Obviously, LBJ was not a massive uh, advocate for uh, racial justice, but through a mass yeah. movement and a lot of protests, essentially protesters forced him to sign Civil Rights Act. And yeah. we're kind of learning from that movement in understanding that we really don't have time to sit around and wait for a government that is going to jump right up and sign the things we need. And that's why we are, you know, we're excited about the election and we're pushing for as many climate conscious people as possible. But more importantly, after the election, knowing that we have to come out in force, whether that be through school strikes, uh, or that be through office sit-ins, things like that, direct action that really uh, push how urgent the issue is. I think you stated that really well. It, it, it is about um, governments making changes, but it's really about the citizens pushing those governments to make those changes. And that's yes, people, exactly. people like us engaging, right, and putting, putting mm -hmm. the pressure on. So thank you so much for being a leader. Again, to our attendees, we'll post uh, contact inf information at the end of the webinar. Um, mm -hmm. Real quickly, I'd like to plug yeah. that um, the Sunrise Movement, uh, in conjunction with several different economists, politicians, etc., uh, just wrote and released a fantastic book about the Green New Deal. I could only give a real, you know, nutshell rundown of it here, but it's called "Winning the Green New Deal." Our hub um, here donated one copy to the local library. It okay. should be available soon, so definitely uh, check that out. Read that book. It's uh, there's a lot of misinformation regarding the Green New Deal and what it is and what it's trying to do. Um, but I think that being educated about that and knowing why uh, youth activists are so uh, uh, respond to the Green New Deal so well and that why that's what we're fighting for is really important. I love that idea, Dylan. When um, when we transition over to Maria next, I'd love for you to put that a link in the chat to to that book you're talking about, and maybe we can host a virtual book club as the as the next thing we do. Just kind of an idea to put it out there. Reach out to me if you think that's a good idea. Yeah, it's I think that'd fun. be fun. Yeah. Hey, oh, look Sarah, at that. I just want to say something on yeah. on, uh, on Dylan's efforts and the Sunrise Movement, the youth movement more broadly. Is we had a lot before COVID. We had a very large climate strike here locally. And so there's always that question, you know, what are the, you know, what is kind of civil, um, you know, civil engagement at this level? What does it achieve? And what I can tell you is after that climate strike, the political leaders I was speaking to in a regional context were very aware of the climate strike. They, they understood what that meant. And so the youth, you know, looking to get engaged, you being out there being a strong, loud voice will, will allow for change that you can't even fundamentally see. And that's why it's so important to Dylan's efforts to be so loud. So thank you so much, Dylan. Yeah, thanks, Nick. That's that's a great point. Uh, <laughs> or I'll plug uh, my email and then um, Nyla's email, who is a who is another youth activist here, who's much better at writing, responding to emails than I am. <laughs> I'll put I'll put her information um, in the in the chat box as well. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Dylan. All right, folks. I'm looking at the the timer at 12:44, and I've got three guests to get to next. Um, I'll be talking with Maria next, and then we're gonna to talk to Jeanette and finish up with Sue. So hopefully um, we can all keep an eye on time and make sure everybody gets to, to have their say. So with this, I'd like to bring um, Maria into the conversation. Maria is the ex executive director at the Sugar Pine Foundation. And I invited her here today because I think her organization um, has a really like, she has volunteer opportunities and she also is planting trees and a lot of what we hear about in terms of climate mitigation you know has to do with um planting more trees and and you know kind of on a worldwide level i don't know about your twitter feeds but i have all these like one trillion trees in feeds and things like that that i've that i subscribe to um but maria but maria's really looking at the whole ecosystem and the and the tr the the trees that are growing up here and she's seeing changes and she's trying to do what she can to create a resilient environment up here. So Maria, welcome. And um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your organization and what, uh, what brought you to doing that work. Yes, certainly. I was trying to illustrate that our office is the forest. 
<laughs> I was trying to set up, and I hope you can hear me and see me well. Um, the Sugar Pine Foundation is a nonprofit. Um, we are involved in forest restoration. Many of you may know what sugar pines are. They have these beautiful long cones, the longest cones in the world, up to 24 inches. They're a type of pine in the white pine family, and all the white pine family is plagued by a non-native invasive fungus called white pine blisterus. Mm -hmm. What we're doing is trying to restore these trees back into the environment, because a lot of them are dead, dead from this um, uh, exotic fungus. Um, but we've spread a little bit further from that, and now we do fire restoration also as part of that and we plant a lot of jeffrey pines which everybody in tahoe should have in their yard we recently so we're involved more in uh, as far as climate change goes our i mean of course we're involved in climate litigation um, mitigation because we plant trees and trees take up carbon but also climate resiliency because um we are restoring these species that um like how I personally relate to this is um, I, I went to a lecture that said, um, oh, in the future, we're going to have oaks and uh, rattlesnakes and uh, poison oak in Tahoe. We're still going to have Jeffrey pines and sugar pines, but in le smaller numbers. So we are trying to keep those species around and do restoration after fires. And we're really hands on the ground. Um, I think that kind of work inspires people to get jobs, green jobs and vote green when they have a personal connection. So we work a lot on creating a personal connection to the forest and to the tree, to trees and just the environment in general. We recently had a call on Facebook for people to send a seed and we got over 200 packages. So um, the forests were closed and we couldn't collect seeds for reforestation. So we put a call out, can you please collect just people? Well, normally we climb the trees, but you can also collect seed from the ground. So this is sugar pine seed. Um, but we called for a lot of Jeffrey pine seed because that's the main tree in the forest, about 80%. Um, and people really love that. And just to have something small to enable them to do something small for the environment. And hopefully that would plant a seed in their head that to vote green, to be engaged and be an activist for climate change and environmental programs in general, pres preservation, conservation, and restoration. Very well said, Maria. I think, I think you're right about that. I don't know about the other folks on the panel, but I've, I've, I've planted a lot of trees in my life, and it, it does have kind of a, um, actually, that's what I did as a Peace Corps volunteer in uh, the, the savannah in uh, West Africa, because it really, I think it, it, you invest in the long term vision when you plant a tree, right? And I think that that's what's so missing from the political arena, right, is a long-term vision. And I think that tree planting can really have that powerful effect on us to really like pause and think about like, what's this gonna be like in 10 years, 20 years, right? 50, so, 100 years. And there yeah. is a wise man plants a tree under whose shade he will never sit. Yes, and, I love that. And yeah, it's an investment in the future. Um, a forest, uh, I mean, the trees are this big that we plant, and the tree behind me is 100 years old. And by the way, I live in the Angora fire, so all these trees are charred from it, but a lot of them survive, but that is a big restoration side of ours. Yeah. That's a great example. Maria, thanks so much for doing what you do. And um, I know in, in non-COVID times, it's easier to host volunteer planting events, but I'm, I'll post your information at the end of the webinar and uh, let people reach out to you. Thank you so much. And we need to turn um, over to Jeanette at South Tahoe Refuse. Um, 
So I invited Jeanette here today because I wanted um, folks to take a, um, kind of take stock of where they are on their per, in a, on a personal level, you know, how they're the kind of personal choices that they're making. And I was on a webinar the other day where um, somebody mentioned that they had heard that that uh, waste in this community had gone up by Jeanette, can met, correct me if I'm wrong, because I am so shocked about this, but I think it was 75,000 tons a day. So um, during peak times, I'll, I'll just address that really quickly. Hi, I'm Jeanette and with Altaho Refuse. First off, thank you so much for letting me be a part of this. I feel like I am in incredible company and I'm very grateful that you even invited me. So thank you for that. Um, but to address your point, uh, your question about the garbage. So during peak times, like holidays, weekends, sometimes, um, you know, during the summer, long weekends, we um, go through about 275 tons of garbage a day here that comes to our transfer station. Since COVID came on board, um, that has increased by about 30%. So another, add to that another 75,000 tons coming through our little town um, for processing. Um, and I do want to mention a couple of things to Dylan's point, where you talked about how um, you want to look at the future and be able to preserve what we have. I grew up here in Lake Tahoe. I came here in 1968, and I can tell you that things have changed dramatically. There is, it's not the town that it used to be, and part of that is just natural progression, but a lot of it is because, you know, we're not necessarily thinking about climate change and what impact that has um, on our environment. And then also to, um, to, De to uh, Diedrich's point and to Nick's point, um, this is far from political. This is about our world and how we are the stewards of that world. And all the actions that we take, even on a daily basis, with um, people creating on average four to five pounds of waste a day, it really matters some of the decisions that we make. So I'm the sustainability coordinator and I'm also a family member. Our family has uh, been the local hauler here since about 19, since 1962, which I think is kind of neat. We're not beholden to shareholders or big corporations as to how we manage things. One thing I've learned about um, our community and that I take very personally is that we are, every time we are actively promoting climate change awareness here, it matters. It definitely matters. If I can in any way help our community to understand the massive impacts individual behaviors have on changing climate negatives, we win both locally as well as globally. And I can tell you right now, I see everyone's trash. If you are in our collection area, I know exactly what you throw away. And that, that means whether you live here or whether you're just visiting. So I can tell pretty much on a regular basis how we're doing. And I take that completely to heart. Um, for me, when I think about climate change, um, the first visuals that come to my mind, I think about the waters warming, um, and then the single use items and how they mm -hmm. kind of have incorporated into what our environment looks like today. And that's in assessing the um, presence of microplastics in our lake as well as just in, on our beaches and in our lands. So if I just, and I tried to really be careful about what my first thoughts were. And one of the things about the lake warming has to do with climate change, but it's also about behaviors. We have a lot of boats turning up water. And if you take a cold glass of water and you stir it up, it's gonna warm faster than if you just let it sit there. So that's something to think about too. So it's, it's behaviors, it's um, climate activism and how we look at everything. Yeah, um, I think well, about how, how all of, like the big trucks that are needed to carry all of our trash and the, if we're increasing so much with our single use plastics, it's that many more trips in and out of the basin for these giant diesel trucks, right? And even bigger the problem than that is the fact that um, we're, so we're responsible for all of the waste management here. Um, mm -hmm. We are directed by state and local mandates regarding collections, but we are compelled by our conscience. And so because we are family owned and we are um, family residents for decades, we are really, really careful um, to make sure that how we implement those programs are the most efficient way to encourage um, diversion from the landfills. We are constantly striving to improve the programs that we that complement the sustainable waste hierarchy. And if you get a chance to look at the waste hierarchy, that is super important because you'll see one of the first things is reduce. 
It's reduce mm -hmm. the use of anything that that cannot that is going to stick around, even if it's you know for more than a year. Um, the, this results in a consistent level from the, for, stand, for South Tahoe refuse of exceeding any tiers that may be mandated to us or legally told to us um, associated with landfill diversions, recycling, and the reduction of greenhouse gases. This is a big deal. If you look for SB 1383 um, and the, re, uh, the, the separation of organics out of the landfill, that's huge. It's a big deal and it's important. Um, yeah. So what we do is we, we look for um, outreach, education, animal mitigation programs, <laughs> and collaboration with other environmental organizations. We're constantly having to adjust for the best possible outcomes towards a sustainable culture. So anytime an animal gets into your garbage, landfill. Yeah. I, I, I don't think I need to yeah. say any more. Keep the animals out of the garbage. There's ways to do it. If you need help, please call me. I'm happy to talk about it. It's, um, it's kind of what I do. <laughs> that, that, what that does is when, when animals don't get into household garbage, anything that's recyclable that might have a chance of being put into the closed loop of, of post-consumer manufacturing and recycling, that's the only way it can go. If it's contaminated, yeah. landfill. And yeah. I, I, think I have no opinion about that, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> it is an important issue in this community. And I just want to say, um, to your, your, your business, South Tahoe Refuse, is a private business. It's taking leadership on, the, on this issue. And I think that um, I appreciate that you, you're being here. You're kind of representing, you know, private enterprise taking leadership in sustainability matters and trying to do better and, and, and not waiting for government to tell you to do better. You know, yeah, I think that's know, really great. What I get, the questions I get is how, what, what can people do to help my efforts? Because um, I just... I think that as we look back on COVID, and that's really been challenging, some of the substantial landfill impacts have given us immense volumes of waste no matter, with nowhere else to go. Think about 139 billion face masks a month alone that are not recyclable. The things we purchase, how we choose to navigate our daily lives, travel, or recreate all contribute to climate change in some way. Think about leaving no trace. Our personal choices determine the production of all of our everyday items that not only require energy resources, but will also influence the ultimate toll on the environment, including greenhouse gases that contribute to rising temperatures. So what I tell my grandchildren and my children, think about innovation. Because of our local environment, we should be hypersensitive to impact. Humans have enormous potential to solve big issues. Uh, whereas we have been around for long enough to remember some of, some of the things before technology, this generation has an incredible starting point. The tools available for advancement and eco-friendly design of the items we use every day have an enormous advantage. Research the bigger issues. Don't just, if it doesn't make sense, then, give, give, then make it give you pause. Don't take the every so-called solution at a face value. It's worth your efforts to investigate. Never take a small effort for granted. It all adds up. Think about one plastic Great. bottle times 60,000 people. And this behavior is going to affect us not only local by a cycle, but our, us globally as well. <laughs> well said, Jeanette. I really appreciate it. Um, individual actions matter. And we're going to um, visit my last guest here, Sue Chandler, who also believes that same thing and I, in, slight, in a different sort of way. Sue yesterday hosted a whole hour on why voting matters to the climate. And I, want, I invited her, to, her here today in case anyone missed that and to hear really about um, you know, how, how these things are tied up and how people, how people get involved. Like, what does it really me mean if somebody wants to, like, get involved with, you know, to get candidates elected? Sue, let's turn okay. it over to you. We might go a couple minutes late to our, uh, our attendees, just to let you know. Apologies for that. But uh, we really want to hear from Sue. Thanks very much. I'm going to try to keep this very short. Uh, I hope that all of you will try to watch the webinar that was presented yesterday. Uh, in it, uh, Bren Kennedy and Pamela Schwartz gave amazing presentations as to how they feel uh, government can make improvements as far as the climate is concerned. Our club goes out of its way to support candidates that have uh, a we advocate for progress, equality, and sustainability in our community. And we also promote people that do the same thing. Um, it's uh, so important, your vote. 
Uh, an example I gave yesterday was, think how different the world would be right now if Gore had beaten Bush in the year 2000. How our climate policies would have been in a totally different direction. How our reaction to September 11th would have been totally different. Um, this year is probably the most consequential election of our time. In the four years that Trump has been president, he's reversed a hundred climate actions. And this affects our water, our air, our landfills. Uh, basically, he's done in probably 12 years of hard work that was done by previous administrations. Um, we have a congressman that does not believe in climate change. Uh, and unfortunately, not only doesn't he believe in climate change, he doesn't even want to listen to people that, or the scientists that present him with data to just say that, you know, this is something that we as a community have to do. Uh, Pamela Schwartz is running against a senator for state senate who has about a 12% rating from the League of Conservation Voters. So even though we can work individually, which certainly we all should be doing, whether or not it's by putting solar panels on your home, uh, recycling as much as possible, uh, we also have a commit to vote and foremost at our voting should be the uh, environmental welfare of our planet because we need to have something to pass on to our children. So please get out there, vote, and let people you know know the uh, policies. Yeah. And I just, office. I wanted to add that our, our website at Tahoe Climate Change Action Network.org has. Um, some materials from uh, those running for local office if you want to read climate st uh, climate statements from local uh, candidates and responses to a, a survey there so sue how, if, if someone wants to go like door to door and like pass out stuff like how does that work do they reach out to you to okay so this to? past uh, election cycle, um you know at this point uh we're pretty much done. Uh, yeah. We've mailed our information to all Democrats in the South Lake Tahoe Basin all over El Dorado County. This past weekend, we put literature under the doors of almost 4,000 mm -hmm. homes, and those were people that are no party preference. We have reached out to low propensity voters that are Democrats by writing them individual letters. Mm -hmm. um, I will put our website on board. Uh, we are going to have election observers at our vote centers from October 31st to November 3rd. If you have two hours to spare, please sign up for a slot. We are concerned that there might be some voting harassment in South Lake Tahoe, uh, just based on the number of uh, election signs, yard signs that have not only disappeared, just been vandalized. So it's not the greatest environment, but we would really like to have people at our vote centers. Uh, there's 38 slots at the vote center that will be at the, uh, um, at the college and 38 slots for the vote center that will be at the California Conservation Corps. All right, great info. And again, to those of you watching, um, please watch uh, Sue's, Sue's webinar from yesterday available at our website. And with this, I need to wrap us up, everybody. Um, I think that we, we provided all kinds of opportunities for people to engage on climate action. I'm super grateful to the, the panelists. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now so attendees can take a screenshot and see how they can reach out to you and your organizations. Um, and uh, so, yeah, please, uh, yeah, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and uh, visit me tomorrow during our uh, watch party with the countdown.ted.com's content with inspiring global leaders in climate change. And with that, I'm gonna um, call it good and thank everybody so much for, for joining us. And uh, you'll find this uh, recorded on our website as well. Share it with friends. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone.